One of the areas that I think I would like to expand a little bit more on is really how did this play out, especially for our, our Asian American population? Mainly because to this day, there are so many misunderstandings, misinterpretations, or myths that are out there, right? And especially in education, might I even say it, in education research, that really we need to really disentangle some of those, uh, those concepts, if you will. So uh, if we think about, right, just a brief, brief, brief overview of Asian Americans in the history of United States uh, schools, uh, we also have to go back to kind of where and when do they enter, right? So we think about it from the history of Asian America in the U.S. from the 1700s. If we think about the Filipinos who jumped uh, ship from the Spanish galleons in Louisiana, right? Right. So the, even the oldest population of that generation of Filipinos in Louisiana, there is still the family that still survives from there. So we're talking about, and I can't do the math, I'm not good in math, but many, many, many generations that follow suit from those first uh, inhabitants. We also need to think about how diverse Asian America is, right? I mean, that's at least 40 different ethnic groups, if you think about it. Now, I want to pause a little bit and ask you, right, to think about, can you even name five? I would think you could name five, but maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to fault you if you can't. But just think about that. Can you even name five? If you can name 10, that's even great. But can you name 30 or 40? Right? But that's how vast and diverse, if we think about Asian America, what that means. And also, if we think about Asian America, is still a population that is becoming, right? Along with uh, Latino, Latino groups, it's the fastest uh, growing group, especially in our nation's schools, K-12 and higher education. So if we think about that, that's also important indicators. But also with so many other groups, it's been uh, marked by various immigration patterns, immigration laws, policies, global wars, especially if we think about it in the 20th century uh, and now, and thinking about what that means in the context of a population that is still trying to get an understanding of its own history. Of course, we can say that about so many others, but it's just uh, a way for us to think about. But also, as these groups are becoming more diverse, kind of not quite understanding what the histories are, um, it's also coming to a place in higher education for example, where some of the questions that go around on college campuses would be, you know, are, should Asians be considered racial minorities? And these are the kinds of questions that aren't raised in the public, but I know that it comes up behind closed doors. So this is just another visual. Of course, there are so many kinds of visuals available, but to really show you the face of today's Asian America. It might be who you're familiar with, it might not be, but it's to really showcase there's so many gradations that we need to uh, take account uh, and realize that it's always becoming. Identity is, is in itself such a shifting mode of representation. But when that identity becomes racially marked, right, what does that mean? And how do we think about that in a historical sense? When we think about uh, how right, in the history of the United States, and we might say in, in other global contexts, but what has been this historical framing of Asian Americans, Asian-ness? Um, there might be many ways, but I would say there, there, these are kind of the major organizational or ideological ways that Asian Americans have been formulated. And this notion of this foreigner outsider racialization that legal scholar Angelo Anchetta makes, that, um, um, you know, how do we think about this? And Mia Tuan also talks about this in her book, Forever Foreigner or Honorary Whites, right? So how do we think about this kinds of foreigner status that you are marked, that you can't, you're not quite seen as that acceptable citizen, right? That we would always be speaking with an accent. And some of you, I don't know, maybe I would ask you yourself as you're watching me, when you first saw me, would you have assumed that I 
spoke with an accent or didn't, um, and that, oh, well, would she really be qualified to talk about racial issues, right, in the United States? Um, and it's, again, not to fault you for having these thoughts, but it's the way that perhaps we've been socialized to think about people who look like me, right, teaching these types of courses. So I want you to also take a self-reflection moment in thinking about why, why do we think the ways in which we do? And how have we become socialized to think about that? But now, how do we then talk back to the ways that we've been socialized to think that aren't rooted in historical evidence, okay? So there's that notion of outsider foreign racialization, right, that affected citizenship and citizenship status in the United States, right? And also for Latino, Latino populations that we don't quite fit in to the, the fabric of U.S. citizenship. Uh, there's also this notion of yellow peril that becomes very pertinent in the late uh, 19th century as we think about the kind of Asian horde, especially the Chinese horde coming to take over the jobs, right? They're taking over to uh, steal our women, right? These kinds of phrases are pretty much similar as we think about the history of the United States, as we think about the threat to the US, to the threat to white womanhood, the threat to white manhood, and we think about that sense of yellow peril. Well, as it being a threat to the social order, we also think about it in terms of the threat to society as well as schools, okay? Now, uh, I've also argued with um, several other uh, authors and, and parts that we've co-authored, that if we think about this modern day conception of Asians as model minorities in the United States, it's not that different of that outsider racialization and yellow peril configuration, right? That I say it's an extension of the way we think about uh, model minorities as different from the norm, whatever that norm might be, right? And it's something to be feared because it's seen as a threat. And another way to think about that, again, is through these historical visuals. These were unfortunately very popular, um, especially in the 1880s uh, as that exclusion law, 1882 Chinese exclusion law becomes developed. And so you have a lot of these kinds of, and this is an advertisement, okay? So this is an advertisement out of Dixon, Illinois. I don't know how many of you know where Dixon, Illinois is, but uh, I had a former student come from Dixon and he said, you're not going to see many Chinese Americans in Dixon, Illinois. It's, I, Dixon is a fine place, but he was just saying, this is not the kind of reality that we knew about growing up with uh, much racial diversity. Well. Considering that this advertisement, right, the magic washer developed by George D. of Dixon, Illinois, uh, is portraying Uncle Sam, right, America, kicking out that caricature, these gross caricatures as being uh, rat-like, if you think, you know, if you kind of look at the, the, the pictorial depictions of, of the, the Chinese characters. Uh, but it's also playing into the fears of the American public about, well, we don't need to worry about them taking over these laundromats and washing because now we have the development of a new magic washer that will not only improve our lives through this new technology, but also, right, ward off uh, that unwanted foreign element into our land. So there's so many different elements that can be, that's uh, represented uh, through this advertisement, but really speaks to that larger public discourse about anti-Chinese, about how the Chinese must go. And if we think about how that anti-immigrant rhetoric plays out in our political landscape, how those kinds of languages and phrases are there, but it might be attached to different populations, but how we also need to keep that in mind. And as we think about how did this play out in the life of real people, right? Because previously there, again, there was that stereotypical way of looking at um, Chinese immigrants. But here's a real case where we think about the case of Mamie Tape in San Francisco in 1885. So Mamie Tape is in the middle of that uh, photograph there. And, and her parents, right, are advocating for the right, not just for Mamie, but her siblings, as well as so many other uh, Chinese immigrants, Chinese Americans, 
Americans, because these kids are American born, to have the right to attend their local public school with white children, right? So it's this idea that we shouldn't have to travel and traverse how many other schools just to get to that separate Chinese school, right? Or that separate Mexican school or the colored school in the South, but to have access to the kinds of schools that we need to. Now, even though the courts ruled in favor of Mamie Tate because of all the various uh, arguments that I laid out before, right? thinking about the commonalities of the argument, the local school officials and school districts made up additional uh, qualifications so that she didn't have all of her vaccination papers, right? So along with that, along with other kinds of barriers that they set up, they set up a separate school for Chinese, Mongolian kids to attend in San Francisco. And the interesting thing about the Mamie Tape case in 1885, it then, unfortunately, sets the precedent for, um, and it's a court case that's also cited in Plessy versus Ferguson, if we think about legalizing separate but equal. So Mamie Tape's case is one of many others that becomes cited as precedent for allowing that system of separate but, uh, separate, uh, but equal, or separate and unequal, in the American South in the 1890s. And to give you more of kind of a textual information about the case, I'm not going to read it all, but it's available for you to really uh, delve into yourself, right? So how Mamie Tape, in the case of Mamie Tape, and her parents, and her mother being a very talented artist as well, how she uses her sense of agency, and this is also unusual, right, that uh, we think about uh, Asian American female initiative, right, and agency in that light, to think about how her parents really advocated for or not just, again, for the right of her own children, but for those who are eligible to enter our public schools and why that particular fight was so important for other cases going forward.